So far, all operations on lists were first order. That means the functions took lists or primitive types as arguments and returned them as results. In this session, we're going to change that. We're going to introduce higher order list functions that work on lists and take another function as argument. We will see that with just a handful of these higher order functions, we can describe a great variety of different tasks. The examples in the previous sessions have shown that functions on lists often have very similar structure. In fact, we can identify several recurring patterns, such as transforming each element in a list in a certain way, or retrieving from a list all elements that satisfy a given criterion, or maybe combining the elements of a list using an operator. And since we're in a functional language, which allows programmers to write generic functions using higher order functions, we can apply the same techniques to functions over lists. So in this session, we are going to be interested in higher order functions over lists. A first common operation is to transform each element of a list and then return the lists of results. So for instance, to multiply each element of a list by the same factor, you could write a function scale list, which takes a list of doubles as input and a factor and returns a list of double. And what it does is, well, if the input list is nil, it just returns it unchanged. And otherwise, it multiplies the first element of the list by the factor and it does a recursive call of scale list with the rest of the list and factor. So obviously that uh, function would multiply each element of the list by the same factor. That scheme can be generalized to a method map on the list class, which can apply an arbitrary operation to all elements of a list. So here's a simple way to define map on the abstract class list of t. We would say def map and map takes a function from t to some other type u, which could be the same as type t, or it could be different. So u is a type parameter of map, and then it returns a list of u. And then the body of map is just like the body of scale list, but now generalized. So in the case of nil, we return the list unchanged. If the list is non-nil, then we apply the function f to the first element x, and we follow that with a recursive call of xs.mapf. In fact, the actual implementation of map in class list in the Scala standard library is a bit more complicated for several reasons. First, uh, the actual definition is in fact tail recursive, whereas th this definition isn't. You see, after the call to map, we still have a call to cons. And second, the uh, actual implementation of map works for arbitrary collections not just lists. But for understanding map, this definition here will do very well. So using map, we can now write scale list much more concisely, so much more concisely that it's hardly worth writing a different function for it. We would just say scale list of xs and a factor is map xs map with the function that takes an x and multiplies x by the factor. So here's an exercise for you. Let's take a function square list that squares each element of a list and returns the result. Uh, there are two possible ways to do that, either with pattern matching or using map. I invite you to try both possible ways by filling in the three uh, triple question marks in the definition of square list here and the definition of square list down there. So let's see how we would do that. In the pattern matching definition, uh, it, to take the squares of an empty list, we would surely return the empty list again. To take the squares of a list with a head y and a tail ys, what do we do? Well, we start by taking the square of y, and we follow that by a recursive call of square list of ys. So far, so good. I think by now we all know how to do these things cold, but let's see whether we can do it shorter using map. Well, to use square list with map, what can we do? Well, we map it by the function that takes an x and returns x times x. And that's it. So, obviously the definition with map is much shorter and I would argue also clearer than the one that uses pattern matching and recursion. So here's another common operation on lists. 
selecting all elements that satisfy a given condition. For instance, you might want to select all elements from a list that are positive. Here you have a function posElements. It takes a list of int, gives you back a list of int. And the pattern matching definition would read as you see here. So for the empty list, we can just return it. If it's non-empty and the first element is in fact greater than zero, is positive, then we include it in the result list. So we return the first element followed by posElements of the rest of the list. And otherwise we just do posElements of the rest of the list. So the first element gets dropped and we just filter the remainder of the list with posElements. Again, this pattern can be generalized to a method filter in the list class. So here you see the definition of filter. It takes now a predicate that takes an element of the list element type t and gives you back a boolean. And it will return a list of t's. The definition is an obvious generalization of uh, poselems that you've seen before. So we match on the current list. If it's nil, then we return the nil list. If it's not nil, and the head of the list xs satisfies our predicate, so p of x is true, then we return x followed by xs.filter p and otherwise just xs.filter p. Again, using filter we can write poselems much more concisely. We would just write xs filter x such that x is greater than zero. Besides filter, there are also other methods that extract sublists from a list based on some predicate. You see the list of these methods here. Rather than going through the list, I just wanted to show them uh, in action in a new worksheet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the data definitions of the previous worksheet and create a new worksheet. Call this, call this list fun. And we have our test data here. And what I'm, what we're going to do is, uh, let's say the first one would be nums filter um, uh, so all numbers greater than zero. So that would have filtered out the minus four here. If we do nums filter not x x greater than zero, what do you expect to get? Right, you'd expect to get just the negative number, minus 4. Uh, the other method was partition. Partition is like filter and filter not in one go. So if you write that here, then what you see is you get a pair of two lists. The first list contains all those elements for which the predicate here is true. So that was the positive elements, and the second list contains all those elements for which the predicate is false. So you see that partition is just like filter and filter not as a pair. However, it will run in a single traversal through the input list numbers, whereas if you do first a filter and then a filter not, you would get two traversals. The next two functions are a bit different in that they look at a prefix and a suffix of a list. So um, what I can do here is I can say nums take while x x greater than zero. So what that gives me is the longest prefix of the list such that the predicate is true. So here I would say, okay, two is greater than zero, but then at minus four, I would stop because minus four is not greater than zero. So it will, any further elements will not take part in take while. That's the main difference between take while and filter. Filter will always select all elements in the list that satisfy the criterion, whereas take while will only take the longest prefix of the list. The opposite of take while is drop while. So let's write that. So take while and drop while relate to each other, such, just like take and drop relate to each other. Drop while would then return the remainder of the list without the prefix taken by take while. So it would be the list that starts with a negative element and then goes until the end of the input list. And finally, uh, where we had partition that combined a filter and filter not, we also have an operation that combines a take while 
in the drop file. That operation is called span. So if we do that, then what we will see is that it will give us essentially the combination of a take while, that was the list 2, and a drop while, but like partition it will only need a single traversal, not two. Let's apply the function that we've seen so far in an exercise. The task is to write a function pack that packs consecutive duplicates of list elements into sublists. So if we apply pack to this input list here, we would expect to get back a list of lists where the first sublist is formed from, from the three consecutive A's here, the second sublist has just a single B, the third sublist has the two consecutive C's, and the final sublist has the trailing A here. The idea is to use a template like this one here. Uh, we have a defined pack to be a generic function over type lists of T, returns a list of list of T. Uh, obviously, if the list is empty, then that's what we would expect back. So the only case to handle is really this case here. If the list is non-empty, what do we do? I've already copied my input list data and the template of the pack function. So the only case to fill in is when the list is non-empty, consisting of a head x and a tail xs. Which of the six functions here would be applicable? Well, what we want to do is take off a leading uh, sublist and then do something with the rest of the list. So it's a combination of take while and drop while, and that's what span would give us. So let's set up a pattern match first rest equals xs span. And what should be the predicate be? Well, we say take elements as long as they are equal to x, the leading element of the list. Once we have that, uh, we would say first is already the sublist that will constitute the first element of our list, and uh, the other elements would be the result of a recursive call of pack to the rest of the list. And that gives us our function pack. So let's apply pack to our data list. Pack of data gives us a list consisting of three A's, one B, two C's, and an A, just what we needed. We're not done yet. As a second exercise, I would like you to use pack to write a second function, encode, that produces a run length encoding of a list. Run length encodings are often used for compressions of images and other files. Uh, the idea is to con encode n consecutive duplicates of an element in the list as a pair xn. So instead of writing the element n times, we just have a single entry, which is a pair of what the element was and how many times we have written it. For instance, encode of the list that we've seen before should give us a3, b1, c2, and again a1. So let's go again to the worksheet to solve that. What we're interested in is a function encode, and it should also be generic, taking a list of t. And now it would return a list of pairs of the element and the count, which is an integer. And what should the body of encode be? Well, it turns out that most of the work has already been done by pack. Once we have a packed list, uh, all we need is, is a simple transformation to get to the run length encoding. And that transformation will be applied to each element, so the natural operation to use is a map. So what we do is we start with pack of xs, and we then apply a map. So pack of xs yields a list of lists. So uh, if we apply a map, then we uh, get each individual sublist as an argument. Let's call that sublist ys here. And what do we do in the map? Well, we return a pair where the first element of the pair is the first element in the sublist, and the second element of the pair is the length of that sublist. There we are with encode. All we need to do is encode of data to get a single test case, and we get what we expected, a3, b1, c2, and a1.